This is the White House. This is it. On Inauguration Day, the outgoing president has to be out by, I think, noon or 10 o'clock in the morning. Incoming can't come in until 4 o'clock, so you can decide what furniture and what decorations you want in your office. Now, I'd ask my brother to help me set up my office in here. Better architect than I am. So I've tried multiple times to make this particular video. It's such a heavy topic. There's a lot to be said that I don't really think I'm going to get everything that I really want to express said into this video. But I really, really want to convey the urgency of what I would consider to be these times. I think everybody, regardless as to whether or not they are politically literate or politically involved or just pays attention to politics at all, that times are so dire at the very least it is putting people on edge and i fear that at this point we're getting to a place to where we can't go back or at the very least it is harder to go back so right now greg abbott is pretty much waging a civil war between the state of Texas and the rest of the United States because the federal government doesn't want the state of Texas committing fucking genocide at the fucking southern border. This is clearly an atrocity that is absolutely worth talking about, especially for those who aren't talking about it. We're talking about a state's permission to commit genocide, to be violent towards people. This is such a pressing issue because not too long ago, it was Donald Trump who started using Hitlerian fucking language to describe immigrants coming to the United States states it's poisoning the blood of our country uh, it's so bad and people are coming in with disease and to me that is really really terrifying when we start to see the state using rhetoric to justify the killing of certain people groups then really all of humanity is up for grab if one group of people is allowed to be killed off because of whatever reason the state has, that means anybody's really on the menu. Talking about trans issues on my channel is one of the hardest things I have to do because it affects me directly. But there's no denying that it's a real thing that's happening. It's something that we need to be vocal about, especially when trans people are losing more of their rights every fucking year. It's something that is scaring me. I'm beginning to wonder if we're gonna even be allowed to defend ourselves once the state decides that we're on the menu. I think it already has decided we're on the menu. And one of the other things that has been on my mind lately is the existence of Israel as a nation state already and just the whole fact that Israel is committing genocide against Palestine. As of recording this right now, the International Court of Justice has decided that it is plausible that Israel is committing some form of genocide in Palestine. That's the International Court of Justice right there, folks. Now, it should be said that the International Court of Justice doesn't really have a whole lot of power when it comes to deciding things on a judicial criminal level, right? Like the International Court of Justice can't necessarily just put handcuffs on the entire nation state of Israel. That's unfortunately not how it works but i think the main point of my video here really stems from the whole debate about donald trump whether or not he is immune to prosecution by the law because of his ex-presidency role as of recently he's been deemed not immune which is good because holy shit it would suck so fucking much if he wasn't why is trump being immune even up for debate because i actually caught trump going to jail on my way to los angeles i mean I, i'll just put a link in the description if you've seen it you know i caught him on the way to georgia to get arrested it was kind of funny he's been to jail right and he's been criminally convicted how is he still able to run for president in the first place people who have been sent to jail especially for like federal crimes and shit they can't even vote so then why is donald trump able to be president even capable of being president right because everything goes in this fucking capitalist hellscape 
Anything can happen, really. It's unpredictable. It's like a fucking reality TV show, except it's more psychotic. And unfortunately, we're all the participants here. But I think the reason why people were so concerned as to whether or not Trump is immune from prosecution is because it poses a really interesting question. When can you really question hierarchy? Because if hierarchy can't be challenged, then what do you do when hierarchy is unjustified? Well, you can say you can reform it. What do you do when it has been reformed and it is ultimately not doing what you reformed it to do? The 2008 presidential election saw Barack Obama becoming the president of the United States. I was only 17 years old in 2008, so I couldn't vote for Obama. In the grand scheme of things, and with my very little understanding of the war on terror, I wanted to vote for Obama because I was fucking sick of George Bush destroying everything and invading a country in which his fucking subordinates lied about. So Obama was, in all essence, one of the people who would promise to do things like pulling out of Iraq and, you know, making real, real tangible change. Of course, later, I would learn that that's all fucking bullshit. Barack Obama was, at the time, the most bomb-heavy president out of all of the other preceding presidents. Obama reinstated the Patriot Act and the NDAA. And I think what really made me so fucking mad about Barack Obama by the end of his eight-year term was just how cowardly he handled the Standing Rock confrontation between militarized police and the water protectors. The thing the candidates aren't really talking about is the Dakota Access Pipeline. Yeah. Is that something that you would consider intervening in? People have called for your administration to make a call. We're monitoring this closely. And um, you know, I think as a general rule, uh, my view is that there is a way for us to accommodate sacred lands of Native Americans. Uh, and, you know, I think that right now the Army Corps is examining whether there are ways to reroute uh, uh, this pipeline so that's a in a way. Right. So, so we're, we're, we're going to let it play out uh, for uh, several more weeks and, and determine whether or not this can be resolved um, in a way that I think uh, uh, is properly attentive to the traditions of the first Americans. Is there something to be done about the way protesters are being treated right now, though? They're getting sprayed with rubber bullets. We're seeing some kind of shocking footage. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a challenging situation. Um, I, I think that uh, my general rule, uh, when I talk to governors and, and state and local officials, uh, whenever they're dealing with protests, including, for example, during the Black Lives Matters protests, is there's an obligation for protesters to uh, be peaceful, and there's an obligation for uh, authorities to show restraint. And uh, you know, I want to make sure that uh, as everybody is exercising their constitutional rights to be heard, that both sides are refraining from situations that might uh, result in people being hurt. It's absolutely absurd that he can say that the first Americans deserve to have their treaties respected while also acknowledging that this is an uncorrected form of authority put onto the water protectors and the people who live on their reservation. As the commander-in-chief and the president of the United States, Obama had every opportunity to stop this. Yet he did not stop this. He didn't call for the police to pull back. He only made a suggestion that authority should show more restraints. It's hard to take the former president seriously when he doesn't use his executive powers to do the good that the people want him to do. This was a pipeline being privately built by a corporation on land that the US government had for ages now 
had a treaty that this was a reservation for the Lakota Sioux Nation. And Obama just basically sat on his fucking hands. It's why I don't take him seriously. But when Donald Trump became president in 2017, he made the construction of the fucking pipeline an executive order, as well as the Keystone XL pipeline. What this essentially means is that the Democratic Party in the United States don't expel any form of power other than to maintain the status quo, whereas the Republican Party express all of the power and do it for detrimental reasons. Because all of the things that I had just accused Obama over, they're not like uniquely his own problems or his own failings as president. No, like immigration custom enforcement has existed even before Obama. Yeah, ICE was created in 2003 under the Bush administration. So all of those things I said, they're not uniquely Obama's issues. Those are also problems that were initially introduced by the Republican Party. Even look at gun control, for example. Ronald Reagan introduced that into the state of California in the 1960s to combat the Black Panther their party, arming themselves and protecting themselves from law enforcement. You can say gun control is the cause of the Republican Party. They did it. They made gun control a thing. So all you fucking Second Amendment freaks can, uh, maybe I shouldn't finish that sentence. I could go on forever as to how long Donald Trump has completely sunk our fucking country into the shitter. But I think a lot of what happened was that a lot of people began to realize that there are some fundamental problems with the United States. And I think a lot of those people were liberals because liberals were much more interested in taking an opposition against the state because Trump was the state at that point. Now, I don't blame them for having an opposition to Trump. That's not what I'm saying here. What I am saying is that they had an opposition to the state only because of Trump. They all failed to kind of realize that Trump, as nefarious and authoritarian as he is, he happened to take as much authority and power in the first place because the state, as it currently exists right now, allows for it. He's able to have as much authority and power in the first place because the state is designed in such a way it makes it hard to ask the fundamental question, is Trump immune from prosecution? And now this is where we have to really honestly ask ourselves the question, is the state legitimate in its existence? And I'm gonna have to say no. The state of Maine was just introducing some policies that was gonna protect trans people. And that got shot down because according to MainBeacon.com, libs of TikTok spoke about it with their millions of followers. And after this opposition was made, LD1735 was shot down by both Democrats and Republicans, with the Democrats stating that there was an inclusion of unnecessary language as their primary reason for changing their stance on the bill. This bill was initially endorsed by a Democratic Party representative as well as various other medical organizations, including but not limited to the Maine Nurse Practitioner Association, the Maine Psychological Association, and the National Association of Social Workers. Meaning this particular senator that you are looking at on screen right now before you did not listen to several medical organizations as well as her own Democratic Party constituents, but instead took the favorability of her own political opposition and a bunch of fucking astroturf groups that showed up to the Capitol. The Democratic Party has little to no influence on actual policy making or protecting its own citizens from terroristic threats levied by white supremacists and the Republican Party, even at a legislative level. Because while the senator was just spinelessly sitting on her hands letting the Republican Party have their way, Shia Rachik, the owner of Libs of TikTok, was named at the Oklahoma Library Board by the State Superintendent of Oklahoma, Ryan Walters. Almost similarly to Pastor Jerry Cook of Santa Clarita, California, she has inspired school bomb threats across the country. Whenever Libs of TikTok posts anything at all about institutions like medical institutions, 
programs or school institutions that either provide gender affirming care or are accepting of LGBT students. Bomb threats follow. So you know, completely civilized white woman right here who would never resort to violence whatsoever and doesn't revolve herself around violent people. That was sarcasm because Republicans don't know subtext when they see it. Do you even realize how hard it is for me to talk about this? How hard it is for me to convey to all of you who are listening right now that I do not think that the Democratic Party has our best interests at heart? Yeah, the person that you're looking at right now is a non-binary 16-year-old student who was killed. Their name is Nex Benedict. They were routinely bullied at their school. The state of Oklahoma issued a bathroom ban for trans gender people. Next was non-binary. Next could go to either one of the bathrooms in this regard. But this simply goes to show that it doesn't matter about safety in the bathrooms. It matters that trans youth are dead. This means that some fuckwad has more influence on political policies in our government than the Democratic Party does. What happens when you vote for the Democratic Party is you are essentially saying that you have given up on everything. Either that or you you are too privileged to do actual community organizing yourself. <sighs> Take a breather everyone because we're not done. The same thing happened to Texas where a woman who needed an abortion so bad that it was gonna actually get her killed if she didn't get emergency health care, that was fucking blocked after the Supreme Court said she could get emergency care. The United States government, which prides itself on freedom of speech and freedom for all, is literally making the claim that it is more legitimate in ruling a person's medical emergencies than actual licensed medical professionals. Texas Governor Greg Abbott is in a wheelchair and he is making medical decisions for those who need life-saving medical care. The existence of the state will listen to the most privileged people. And only the most privileged people. Because privileged people can go to fucking prison and still run for president, while most prison inmates can't even vote. It is also why when we talk about the police and holding the police accountable, that qualified immunity is an obstacle. It is definitely a some animals are more equals than others situation. And so the state, because it is specifically in power to maintain its own sense of dominance and authority, we've had Joseph Biden become president recently in the last four years. And while I am absolutely thrilled that Donald Trump is no longer president, I cannot say the same about Biden. We must take back the streets. It doesn't matter whether or not the person that is accosting your son or daughter or my son or daughter, my wife, your husband, my mother, your parents, it doesn't matter whether or not they were deprived as a youth. It doesn't matter or not whether or not they had no background that enabled them to have to uh, become a, a social uh, become socialized into the fabric of society. It doesn't matter whether or not they're the victims of society. The end result is they're about to knock my mother on the head with a lead pipe, shoot my sister, beat up my wife, take on my sons. So I don't want to ask what made them do this. They must be taken off the street. It is incredibly rare when liberals acknowledge systemic issues as the prime rudimentary cause to so many of our societal problems. But it is even rarer to see any liberals taking action as a preventative measure. Because this is Joe Biden taking the argument that poverty causes crime and ostensibly saying, fuck that. Social and political reform isn't going to solve that. No, we need to remove individuals of shady character off the streets. Since then, he's become the Vice President of the United States and later on would become the President of the United States. How well has that been going? We should all agree the answer is not to defund the police. It's to fund the police. Hi, I'm Mitt Romney. You might remember me from running for president in 2012 when Barack Obama was the president and you were the vice president. Anyway, this is such a good take that you had Joe Biden. Thank you for standing for the police. <laughs> God damn it. We expect them to do everything. 
We expect them to be to protect us, to be psychologists, and to be sociologists. I mean, we expect you to do everything. Yeah, we expect the police to be psychologists and sociologists. Yeah, next time I need help, I'm going to call the Uvalde Police Department whenever I'm in a mental health crisis for crying out loud, dumbass. And remember, vote blue no matter who wins. This is a man who doesn't give a flying fuck if the problems that we see in our society are rooted in the system itself. He doesn't care if there are resources for mental health crisis. So for him to make a statement about how the police is expected to be psychologists and sociologists is an absolute fuck you to anyone who has gone through a mental health crisis. By the way, with the combination of funding the police and instilling gun control, mass shootings have only increased according to the Pew Research Center. And according to ABC News, almost 5,000 people have died to gun violence in 2024 alone. This means that the funding of the police has not been an effective preventative measure to quell, to stop, or to even eliminate mass shootings in the United States. Americans are frustrated and in fact, 75% of voters say the country is heading into the wrong direction despite the results of last night. What in the next two years do you intend to do differently uh, to change people's uh, opinion of the direction of the country, particularly as you contemplate a run for president? 2024? Nothing, because they're just finding out what we're doing. The more they know about what we're doing, the more support there is. Do you know anybody who wants us to get rid of the change we made on prescription drug prices and raise prices again? This is obviously a really stupid answer, because the answer is obviously no. Nobody wants an increase on prescription drug prices. But Biden feels the need to be defensive here, because he was just told that 75% of voters are frustrated and feel the country is heading in the wrong direction. So what he is doing is he is reaching into his back pocket in hopes that whatever he pulls out of it, it's a coherent enough straw man argument to legitimately shut this fucking interviewer up because all this interviewer did was question Biden's legitimacy and his authority. Do you know anybody who wants us to walk away from building those roads and bridges and, and the internet and so on? Building roads, bridges, and internet. My friend, this is what we pay our fucking taxes for you to do. In theory, on paper, when the state governs over the people, you're supposed to do the things that the people voted you in to do. And these aren't even really things that people voted for you to do. People voted for you because because everyone was so fucking sick of Donald Trump, just like how everyone voted for Obama because everyone's so fucking sick of George W. Bush. For example, I was on the phone congratulating a Californian recently and then someone in uh uh, up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, the congressman who got elected. And he said, can you help us make sure we're able to have high-speed rail, rail service from Scranton to New York, New York City? I said, yeah, we can. We can. First of all, it'll make it a lot easier, take a lot of vehicles off the road, and we have more money in the, in the pot now, already, already out there, we voted for, than the entire money we spent on Amtrak to begin with. It's really funny that Joe Biden is mentioning all of this, because I've already made a video about how Joe Biden is a small part of a much bigger problem that is the railroad industry. TLDR, Joe Biden union busted and East Palestine, Ohio ate shit because of it. And this was by no means exclusively the Democratic Party's fault. I mean, Donald Trump definitely played a role in that. That's why you should probably go watch that video instead, because it goes way deeper into that topic. But all I'm gonna say for now is that Joe Biden really has no place to talk, especially on railroad innovation. It's the same way. For example, I talked about through the campaign that we're gonna limit the cost of insulin for seniors to, to uh, $35 a month instead of $400 a month. Well, it doesn't take effect till next year. Because if it took effect immediately, your Republican constituents wouldn't profit off of Big Pharma immediately. You took their interests into account over your voters. So there's a lot of things that are just starting to kick in. And the same way with what we've done in terms of the environmental stuff. It takes time to get it moving. So I, I'm not going to change. As a matter of fact, you know, there's some things I want to change and add to. For example, we had passed the most bipartisan, we passed the most extensive gun legislation, anti, you know, rational gun policy in 30 years. And, but we didn't ban assault weapons. I'm going to ban assault weapons. They're going to try like the devil. And yet mass shootings are still happening. Biden, you're right. 
Nothing has fundamentally changed. When his election was around and the liberals were very fucking loud about his election, liberals started to get rather condescending towards other leftists, including anarchists, socialists, communists, so on and so forth. And even to just some people who didn't really have faith in the election, people who don't vote by choice. Now I wanna make something really clear. If you wanna vote and you think that's gonna help in the long run, then that's cool. I support you doing that. Don't shame people when they don't vote for your favorite white supremacist. You're making the claim that Biden is everything that Donald Trump is not. What are you really saying about your guy? Like for example, Roe versus Wade was overturned during the Biden administration. Now, of course, the Joe Biden administration didn't do that. It was Congress with a Republican majority vote. But at the same time, from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, white with foam, God bless America. Maybe one of my more controversial takes, but when you failed your own voters, maybe singing God Bless America is not a good idea. In front of protesters who were recently deemed as extremists by the Biden administration, and they were beaten by police officers. That right there is fucked up. Not to mention the Joe Biden administration have committed genocide, allying with Israel, especially in light of all that we have learned since October 7th. The IDF knew that Hamas was going to enact the October 7th attack a year in advance. And I know that some liberal is going to waddle their way in here and say that Biden is giving Palestine millions of dollars in humanitarian aid but he's giving billions of dollars to Israel to bomb the shit out of Palestine. To kind of paraphrase what Ron the Anarchist once said, We want a ceasefire, not a humanitarian pause. A humanitarian pause means nothing. A humanitarian pause means you're going to give people sandwiches before you bomb them to kingdom come. It's not humanitarian. It's pretending to be humanitarian while you know you have eyes on you. It's not doing nothing. It's worse than doing nothing. It's doing nothing and being proud of it. And I think that's ultimately the point I'm trying to make here, folks, is when can we question authority? And it seems like we can't sometimes, or really at all. And if any, I think the amount of times that we can freely and securely question authority is reducing. And what this essentially means now is that we're at an event horizon where I think we're going to start seeing total unmasked fascism at a state level at a federal level even. And I'm just gonna have to say it because it seems like not a lot of people are capable of saying it. The state needs to be abolished. Some people will ask me like, what will we do when the state's abolished and that everything is gone to anarchy? You gotta understand that the state doesn't maintain order. It maintains chaos because the state has definitely existed in the last fucking several generations. And would you say that we currently, right now, live in a state of order? N no. And every time we've asked the state to check itself within the checks and balances part of it all, the state has routinely failed to demonstrate that. Why do you think it's a meme to have the police investigate themselves? Because Clearly, they're gonna find nothing wrong. The police is a white supremacist institution. You really think the police has any interest in trying to stop systemic racism even within its own ranks? Well, no, of course not. It's interested in maintaining itself as a hierarchy. So then what would anarchy look like? Well, 
I can't say for certain. What I can say is that our end goal is that everybody can have a strong and empowered sense of autonomy, a sense of self, a sense of individualism and collectivism to the point to where we can actually maintain a society, but also that everyone is equal, but also that everyone is not more privileged than the other, that everyone can be held accountable, that everyone can maintain a society worth living. And I think part of the problem is that countries maintain a state apparatus because state apparatuses are really good at promoting a sense of nationalism. And the sense of nationalism tends to look very authoritarian. Of course, not everywhere when it comes to nationalism is authoritarian necessarily, especially with nationalists that have been fighting for their own autonomy for generations, like the Kurdish people. But that's like what make America great again means. It means to a lot of people a sense of security. But the existence of our border wall hasn't stopped immigration and it's not like killing thousands and thousands of people at the border like Greg Abbott wants. It's going to stop that from happening either. It's just going to be our taxpayer dollars going to the death of people's families. Not to mention the border wall in general costs so much fucking money to maintain in the first place. So much border wall bullshit actually impedes on other people's land and other people's homes. Before we end this video, I want to talk about the journalist known as Mehdi Hassan and I promise I'm going somewhere with this. Mehdi Hassan is a former talk show host for MSNBC. Mike experience watching Mehdi Hassan was like watching Howard Beale in the 1970 film The Network. If you've ever seen that movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I don't want you to protest, I don't want you to riot, I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being, God damn it! I mention all of this because for a while he was a mainstream talk show host of a mainstream news network. And surprisingly, he got away with saying stuff like this on national television. Here's what I want to do to Mark Kissinger's 100th birthday. I want to talk about some of the many, many people around the world who didn't get to live till 100 or even 60, 70 or 80 because of Henry Kissinger, because of his support for brutal dictators, brutal regimes, brutal wars and war crimes. Let's start where else? In Southeast Asia the war in Vietnam, which Kissinger may have ridiculed. If you haven't already, you need to go back and watch some of his old news clips from when he was working with MSNBC because, oh my god, this guy, I can't even believe they allowed him to be on television. Not that I don't think he should have been on TV. I mean, this is the most rude awakening Americans have gotten since 9-11. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing how earth-shattering some of his commentary was. It actually went against the very main establishment that he himself was being platformed on. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the military pressure. We are nearly six weeks into this bombing campaign and ground invasion. The Gaza Health Ministry says Israel has killed more than 11,000 people in Gaza, including the a record Hamas, number the of Hamas Hamas controlled. Uh, let, the me, Hamas, let me finish my the Hamas question. Controlled. Let me finish my question. No, no but, no, but, no, but you, have to, you can't say that. No, but I, you said you have to say the Hamas controlled. Do you understand what's happening here? He's trying to control the fucking narrative that is being told on mainstream American television. But Mehdi Hassan is not letting this Zionist quack job have his way. So even, and especially for mainstream television, this mainstream news reporter was truly something special. But allegedly, Mehdi Hassan has left MSNBC on his own accord, and honestly, good for him. And with all of you watching at home, it's been a privilege, it's been a pleasure. But as we begin 2024, with an election coming, a war still ongoing, and too many Trump trials, honestly, to even keep track of, and with this show going away, I've decided that it's time for me to look for a new challenge. I haven't paid too close attention to what Mehdi Hassan has been up to since he's left MSNBC, but one thing I did notice was his piece on The Guardian that I think was so amazing, it was so well written. And I want to read you a small part of it. The president's admirers like to refer to him as the comforter-in-chief. His aide calls him a devout Catholic, 
He himself has talked movingly and at length about grief, loss, and pain. So how does that same Biden sleep at night as US-made bombs continue to fall on innocents in Gaza? How does he justify his inaction and complicity? Here is a man who has experienced devastating personal tragedies, losing his 29-year-old wife and 1-year-old daughter at a car crash, and then, decades later, losing a son to brain cancer. Yet Yet he now possesses the power, unique among the 8 billion people who live on this planet, to pick up the phone, dial a number beginning with plus 972, and halt the daily killing of hundreds of wives and children. It really is that simple. So Mr. President, there's no point venting your frustration in private and telling only your aides that the war has to stop. Tell that to Netanyahu. Make the call. End this genocide. This is, honestly, such a fantastically written essay. It is Mehdi Hassan's attempt to get Biden to see a human side of the very people in which he has full capability of standing up for. Part of me thinks that this is not going to work, that Biden is not going to see a human side of the people being bombed in Gaza. I just don't see anyone who currently holds political power as of right now feeling any kind of human sympathy for the people in which they govern over. Or perhaps maybe, just maybe, Biden is too cowardly to be at odds with a US ally. Maybe Biden is too much of a coward to upset that foreign relation, which would absolutely be consistent with everything that the Democratic Party has done practically every time it has any political power for that matter. People have called for your administration to make a call. Uh. But for the benefit of the people, I'd like to be proven wrong. But I just wanted to mention all of this because this is somebody with mainstream attention, with mainstream audiences, with a mainstream reach, questioning authority, and doing so so beautifully. And I think ultimately, it doesn't need to just be him. It can start, continue, with you watching at home. So yeah, abolish the fucking state. Like, straight up. Because the future that we have is slipping away from our fingers. I don't necessarily claim to have the blueprints for our future, but I don't think that the people who are guiding us to the future right now are in any way justified in saying that they do themselves. Anyway, that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this video that I did today. It was nice and fun and good and all that. Peace out.